Well, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. To those visiting with us, it's really good to have you as well. We appreciate your presence. We got uh, several folks that are uh, uh, out. I think some folks are, are traveling for the, the little bit uh, of the holiday weekend and, and are not able to be with us tonight. And then we have a, a lengthy list of sick folk as well. Um, I know got a text from, from Barry and some of that family's been got the symptoms of the flu and so they didn't uh, uh, want to be able to, to be out to, tonight and, and infect everybody else with it. Um, so uh, Eddie Hicks a little while ago, he's tripping along. He fell this week and uh, so he had some repercussions from that and he's just getting over uh, around with the flu as well, I believe. So Eddie's had a, a bit of a time but seems to, to be on the mend. I know uh, Kenton Bias also has been uh, tested a couple of times recently for flu. He's not been feeling well, but every test has come back negative, so we're, we're thankful for that. Um, had an interesting situation today with uh, Jeff Lewis. Now that's Heather Huber's brother that uh, we uh, announce frequently. He has been in the hospital up at UK uh, in the, the uh, Markey Cancer Center up there and they had uh, been running some tests and were going to change his uh, uh, chemo treatments and they, uh, he was having problems with fluid uh, collecting. They had drawn off some fluid and tested it and they did not find any cancer cells in that so they were were thankful for it but his breathing was not working well he's developed pneumonia i think and was down to about 80 uh, percent you know uh, functionality with with uh, the oxygen level and so this morning they were talking about putting him on a vent and uh, he got a hold of heather and wanted to talk to uh to a preacher before he allowed them to do that and so she got a hold of me, and I realized with the, the with they were holding to, to get him on the vent, so he needed to get connected with somebody pretty quick. So I called Landon Rudder up at uh, East End in Lexington, and Landon went right on over and had a really good discussion with him, come to find out that uh, he had obeyed the gospel back in his younger years, but had just been very unfaithful for the majority of, of his life and was wanting to get that straightened out. And so he uh, had a good study with Landon uh, as best he could. He couldn't communicate real well with just pretty much yes and no to answers to questions that Landon asked him. But they had prayer together, and, and uh, Jeff was able to rest a lot easier after knowing that things were, were getting straightened out between him and, and God. So we were very, very thankful and able to rejoice uh, over that, and we pray, continue to pray that uh, Jeff will be able to, to uh, do better uh, health-wise. The other surgeries that we have, uh, we, I think we have, what, three knee surgeries here lately. Uh, I know that uh, Bobby Trowbridge was able to be out uh, Sunday and uh, was, we were very, very thankful for that. Uh, uh, Stephanie is continuing to recover from, from her uh, knee surgery. Luetta had knee surgery as well and she's back home now and making uh, uh, improvement. And as last that I heard, uh, Gene is continuing to make improvement after his uh, back surgery. So we've just had a lot of folks that uh, are, are uh, on the sick list. We had several that have had to struggle with flu or COVID as well. So it's kind of been uh, uh, a lengthy siege of it. But fortunately, most of the, the news that, that we have um, is on a positive side, that folks are, are doing a, a little bit better. Any other announcements about sick folk that we need to pass along as we get started tonight? Yeah, good. Okay, uh, Keith and Paul, I think, are, are out of town, and uh, Barry's not able to be here, so let's do number 253. Number 253, and we'll use this to, to start our song service this evening. Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Trouble and sorrow have vanished away. Christ is mine, all to Him I now resign. I have been, I have been 
redeemed, precious indeed is my Savior to me. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, happy in glory, someday I shall be. Sing the first and last verse of number 127. And after we sing this song, we'll ask Brother Daniel, if you would, to please set our minds in a word of prayer. <clears throat> number 127. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depth of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides in my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He Five hundred twenty-two. Number five hundred twenty-two. 
sing the first and last verse of this, and then we'll dismiss to our classes. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the seas and cross the waves. Onward, dear. Jesus says, give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus says, Jesus says, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus says, Jesus says, shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Invitation song for this evening will be uh, number six hundred. Number six hundred. Symbol for our class. Do appreciate everybody's presence tonight, especially those that's visiting with us. It is good to have you, and we are so thankful that you've come. We are dealing with a study, which is kind of a survey of the uh, minor prophets, looking at those uh, short books, the ones that are referred to as the minor prophets, those shorter ones in the uh, ending of the, the Old Testament. And we've been looking at them in somewhat of a chronological order as to how they fit into the history of what's going on with uh, uh, the nation of Israel and, and Judah. And so tonight, uh, after having finished a, a study, if we go back and, and look over the ones that we have talked about already, we went back and, and looked at a timeline that shows us that in all probability the book of Obadiah was written around uh, 845 B.C. And then you, you come on to the book of Joel, which would be at 830. Then we get to the book of Jonah, which was written around 780 B.C. And then about 755 B.C. or so would have been when Amos was uh, involved in sharing with uh, Israel and Judah the prophecies that God had given concerning them. Now, Amos was not the kind of guy that uh, would first jump out at you as a primary candidate to, to be a um, prophet of God. He was an individual that came from a very humble background. In fact, he was very agricultural in his background. He was a herdsman. He also uh, was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And so he was not from an established family. He didn't have that kind of pedigree. He wasn't from a priestly family. But nonetheless, as it says here in verse 1 of the first chapter of the book of Amos, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. This is not, of course, the Jeroboam that we read about when Israel first split from the southern kingdom. Rather, this is Jeroboam II. And he fits in a little bit later in this history. As we see here, these two kings, Uzziah and Jeroboam II, sitting on the thrones of Judah and Israel, respectively. 
And it is in this situation where Amos is sent to be a prophet of God, to work with them, and to help them understand the right ways of God. As is often the case, whenever a country is doing well, whenever it's ex experiencing certain, a certain degree of affluence and is having a relatively peaceful time with all of its neighbors, it is in these situations that often individuals kind of forget about God. And so is what had happened with both Judah and with Israel. There was not a great concern about spiritual things. There was not the real feeling of a, of a need for uh, drawing close to God. And they became more worldly as they enjoyed the luxuries that they could now afford. But morally speaking, both Israel and Judah were a mess. They were not looking very strictly at the commands of God, looking at the things that had commanded and been expressly given of God as actions that should be practiced among the people. You have, especially in the Northern Kingdom, the continued problem of idolatry, and that problem also permeated down into the kingdom of Judah as well. And so both of these nations are dealing with a disregard for God, and it was more about what's about me? What can I do to, to get ahead? What's going to be, you know, something that I can turn to my advantage? And the poor were grotesquely oppressed by those of affluence, and it is Amos that's called to the forefront to try and help them to understand and consider their ways and indeed to, to repent. Whenever we start out with the, the opening of the, the uh, uh, chapter here and try to get a feeling for Amos uh, himself, it says that as under the section here on page 14, you know, the prophet had not been uh, to the prophetic school. He was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. He was of strong, a strong rural character. His call was clearly of God, however. Tekoa was about 12 miles from Jerusalem and a six, about six miles south of Bethlehem. It was rugged country regarded as the wilderness of Judea. And it was here that Amos tended to a peculiar type of sheep, the Narcods, which produced wool of the highest quality, and he also tended to sycamore trees. This fruit was fig-like. It was slightly sweet and watery, and somewhere and somewhat woody in its nature. It was eaten by poorer people, but it had to be pinched and bruised in order for it to ripen. So there was a lot of work that went into this kind of activity uh, in trying to, to tend to this fruit. And the message that Amos has to present is that the true religion was being threatened in both Judah and Israel by two forces. Through ignorance and a misconception of the true nature of God, there had come about a corruption in religion and morals. We see the same sort of thing even happening in our own land. And secondarily, the military successes of the Assyrians under Ben-Hadad I was a temptation to adopt the worship of the gods of the Assyrians and thus to, to go into apostasy away from Jehovah. It's the idea that the Assyrians seem to be doing really, really well. They're winning their battles. They're expanding their kingdom. Obviously, they have a God that's worth serving, and maybe we should get on board with that as well. Luxury and wealth had bred moral decay and spiritual disinterest. His message, then, was largely one of doom. Note the numerous agricultural references familiar to the common man that are used throughout this book. Oftentimes, it's the common individuals who have more of a sense of God and a dependency upon God who respect and appreciate him. They're not living, shall we say, in the lap of luxury. They're not experiencing great financial affluence, and they realize that in order for them to manage, they need the help of God. But to those who move on beyond that and are more privileged in their way of living, Oftentimes, their fear of God begins to dissipate. There's not much of a care and concern for doing that which is right. Now, in the opening section, 
of this book, we find that he is going to start talking here to uh, seven different uh, nations and giving some degree of instruction as to what was going to happen to these nations as well. So in order, the way my, my PowerPoint worked out when I got it put together, let's go to the study questions and we'll kind of be flipping a little bit back and forth from that to the text as we go through. Now, what did we say that the name Amos actually means when you check the notes? All right, he is the burden bearer. And that applies in several different ways. In terms of common labor, he was not of the privileged class. He was one that literally worked to do what needed to be accomplished. But he also had a burden laid upon him by God. And that was to speak to this nation of rebels and get them to understand their wayward means of behavior and to get them to repent. <coughs> we noticed here that who were the two kings that were in power during the time that he was reigning? Uzziah and Jeroboam II would have been the two kings that would have been in the positions of power in uh, these two nations at this particular time. And as we've mentioned, when you actually look at the economic status of, of Judah and Israel, and they had been somewhat successful in kind of expanding the borders of their kingdom a little bit. Things seem to be going relatively well for them. So it says, what were the general economic conditions in Israel and Judah at the time of Amos's writing? They're getting prosperous. And not only is there prosperity in both Judah and Israel, but it's also a time of peace as far as they're concerned. There is some degree of territorial expansion that goes on, but it's not a, a moment of military uh, uh, endeavor. It's not something where there was a lot of, of uh, uh, sadness because of the loss of soldiers and that kind of thing. It was just a pretty good time for them by and large. We find then as we look to uh, uh, that next question, it goes back to the opening section of the, uh, the book of uh, uh, Amos, and it talks about these nations that God also had something to say to. It says, the opening section of Amos revealed the fate of the sinful nations surrounding Israel and Judah. And it says, list these six nations. Well, whenever we start working our way through that opening text, we find, let's see, there we get it. We see that, as we mentioned, that, uh, and in question number four, Amos was a herdsman. He was also a gatherer of sycamore fruit. But now we're going to get into this opening chapter and see some of the things that are said. Because there's going to be things said about what was going to happen up in Damascus, a kingdom that is north, kind of the, uh, the northeast of Israel itself. There's also going to be a section given dealing with this area down here around Gaza. It was an area that the Philistines had historically controlled. And so this region also was not firmly under Israelite uh, control. Then you have the group that was up at Tyre, which is up here at the very northern edge. These Phoenician states were kind of small kingdoms of their own. These were very uh, seaworthy nations. They did a lot of training. Uh, trading to other countries. And so Tyre and Sidon were up there in that northern section. Then we come down here to the kingdom of Edom, and we've talked about some prophecies about them before, how that this had been a continual thorn in the flesh to uh, Israel, and that there had been a long-standing animosity between the Edomites and the Israelites. The same was true of the kingdom of uh, Ammon and also of the kingdom of Moab. Remember, we talked about historically the background of those nations. E the Edomites were descended from whom? We talked about this. Who were they descended from? Do, do, do. Jacob and Esau. Okay. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. But where did the Moabites and the Ammonites come from? Might trace it back to Lot some way or another. If you remember the story back there in Genesis, we find that after Lot and his daughters escaped the city of uh, Sodom, that they, uh, were, they got their father drunken, committed incest with Lot, and one of the boys that was born was named Moab. The other boy that was born was named Ammon. 
And so from those roots, we find the beginning of these nations as well. And so in looking here at the opening of uh, uh, the prophecies about these nations, Amos is going to help Israel and Judah to understand that God sees everything that's going on in the region. This isn't just about Israel and just about Judah, but God was also aware of the Gentile nations and the things that they did that were right or the things that they did that were wrong. And we find here in verse 2, it says uh, the, of chapter 1, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the inhabitants of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. Everyone need to sit up and take notice as to what God was going to say. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have uh, threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. And I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the plain of Avon and uh, him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden. And the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto Ker, saith the Lord. In other words, Syria was going to also be carried away into captivity. Eventually, the Assyrians are going to come and carry the Syrians away. And once again, we're going to see a nation kind of erased from the face of the earth. And Amos is giving them some degree of understanding of this uh, in advance. He talks about the transgressions. He doesn't go through and, and he basically just talks about their cruelty and how they took things that they wanted and how cruel they were even unto others. We go down a little bit further then in uh, verse 6. And he talks briefly about uh, Gaza, that section over there in red. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. And I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn mine hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord. So God was going to wipe them away as well. They had sometimes consorted with the Edomites and had been partners with them in some of the oppressions against the nation of uh, uh, Israel and Judah. And so God goes ahead and gives details about what was going to happen uh, to them. In verses 11 and 12, thus uh, we find the, the references made to Edom. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity, and his anger did uh, tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon a teman, which shall devour the palaces of Bozrah. So we can look through each one of these, but it's all the same kind of uh, doom that was going to, to happen to them. And enumeration is given of the fact they'd been disobedient to God and they had been harsh and vindictive toward God's people. And so in each one of these situations, God was going to exact a punishment upon them. Now, he then swings in after he's talked about all these surrounding nations dealing with the, the Gaza and, and the Philistine area here, the Edomites, Moabites, Ammonites, going up here through Syria and even up to the Phoenician, uh, the Phoenician area here, Tyre, Sidon, and those general areas. He's now talked about all the kingdoms that surround Israel and Judah. And then he focuses in on Judah briefly. In chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he makes the point, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments and their lies, caused them to err after that which their fathers have walked. But I will send fire upon Judah and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And then he also goes on and talks uh, about the nation of Israel itself. Going down to verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. 
uh, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek and a man and his father will go in under the same maid to profane my holy name and they laid themselves down upon clothes uh, laid to pledge by every altar and they drink the wine of the, con of the condemned in the house of their God so there's immorality evidenced in this there is the same corruption in terms of uh, their, their government and their morality. And so God has numbered all of this region and said it's going to come up short and they are going to be, going to be punished. Now, Amos also cites the fact, uh, as we start moving a little bit further over, um, uh, you know, in the book, he's talking about God's judgments and and the need for these people to, to repent and this kind of thing. But as we get on toward the end of the book, over around chapter 6 and 7 and in through there, he has a series of visions in which he thinks about um, the things that God has done to help bring to their remembrance the things that they were doing wrong and to get them to, uh, to, to repent. And whenever Amos or others pleaded with God, he showed some mercy for a couple of these earlier punishments that was issued. What, it says in the latter part of the book of Amos, there's a series of visions. Which two visions illustrate the mercy of God? All right. The plague of locusts and also the plague of fire. You know, we stop and think about the, the plague of fire. You know, not long ago we had a brush fire that cropped up over in Rockcastle County and it smoked all of us for a good while. You know, those types of fires do have a way of happening, and God is able to engineer destruction through that means as well as the plague of locusts and other things that he could do. But in each case, he didn't have a complete destruction. He gave them a hard time, helped them to understand that he was still in control, but as we see from the evidence of Amos's prophecies, um, they didn't seem to turn themselves around very much from the things that he had, had uh, they had committed. In fact, going back and, and picking up just a couple of, of passages in this intervening section, we find that God's fed up with them, with the shallowness of their religious service and of their unwillingness to do from the heart things that were obedient in the sight of God. If we go back over to the fifth chapter and go down to verse 21, we find God's disposition toward their kind of playing at religion. And we said that they all wanted to embrace numerous gods, hoping that by having some combination of service that it would be a blessing to them. And God says in verse 21, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell uh, in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not regard them, and neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. He said, until you're ready to get serious about repenting, you know, judgment is going to be exacted upon you because there's a lot of stuff that you need to fix. And don't just think that because you go through some motion that I'm going to forget everything. You know, sometimes I think we can do that. In the course of our prayers, we can quickly say almost flippantly, and Father, forgive us of our sins, and then we go on. Not thinking about the sins that we've committed and not being very determined to do better. But since we said, Father, forgive me of my sins, that's got the slate all wiped clean and everything's going to be fine. And so God is making it known that just because we may go through the motions, so to speak, that doesn't necessarily mean that God's patience is still with us whenever he sees the heart that is refusing to change and the refusal to, to repent. So in looking at uh, the, the nations are listed here and going over to question six uh, in the worksheet in her wealth and luxury what had Israel forgotten they'd forgotten God and what have they turned to they had turned to idols and so we mentioned then the two uh, 
visions that uh, the prophet had and each one of those were illustrations of God's mercy that being the one of the locusts or the grasshoppers and and the fire but then as he is making this prophecy and as he is saying these things there is a priest up in Bethel that gets really really ticked off at the things that Amos is saying if we go over to the seventh chapter now and going down to uh, about um, uh, let's see verse uh, 10 it says then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam the king of Israel saying Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel and the land is not able to bear all of his words for thus Amos saith Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land also Amaziah said unto Amos O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more in Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. As you will recall, when Jeroboam set up the golden calves, whenever the kingdom initially split into two, he set up one in Dan, and the other was in Bethel. And so right here close by is where Amaziah is saying, you're saying all these things against the king and we're going to suffer punishment and all of this other, and you haven't got the right to say any of this. And so did Amaziah, or so did Amos just say, okay, I'll hush? No. In fact, he pronounces a bit of a curse upon Amaziah for daring to confront him. In verse 14, then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go and prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. In other words, Amos is saying that bad times are coming, and tremendous punishment is going to be rendered upon you because you dare to stand in the face of the things that God has commanded. Now, one of the maybe more familiar verses from the book of uh, Amos is found over in chapter 3. The prophet is wanting the people to agree to repent and to practice righteousness. And it's very succinctly put together in verse 3. And how does he say that? Can two do what? Can they walk together except they be what? Agreed. You need to get on the same page with me. You know, you need to be willing to turn your lives around, agree with the right ways of God, and do the things that God has, has commanded of you. And so what we find happening here is that, uh, you know, Amaziah tells on, on Amos, carries it to, to the king, and his gripe was because, you know, he's prop, been prophesying uh, against Israel. But the people just are refusing to repent and, and to come around. There's a couple of other interesting points that I wanted to mention before we get to the end uh, of uh, uh, the actual text here in, in Amos, is that there's a couple of things that are alluded to in the book of Amos, and there are some who make quite an argument about what is said over in chapter 8. Uh, we have some folks today who think that Saturday, the Sabbath day, is still supposed to be the day of worship. We have groups in, in our own community that, that hold to, to the Sabbath day, and they're not trying to morph that over to the first day of the week. It's just Saturday is the day that folks are supposed to go to church. Well, whenever we, we get to the 8th chapter and looking at verse 4, he said that these individuals, there were some who were really exploiting the poor. They didn't want to take the Sabbath day as a day of rest. They did whatever they could to exploit the people. He said in verse 4, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fall. And this is what they said. 
is when will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephath small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances of deceit. In other words, they were longing for the day that nobody would be grumbling about them taking advantage of other people. There'd be nobody saying that the Sabbath should be observed. Just get out of the way and let us do what we want to do. And as you drop down to verse 9, there's an interesting passage. And here the Amos is answering them back in terms of their folly. And he says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. When would the admonition or the commandment about remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, when would that law go out of effect? When Christ died. What happened on the day that Christ died? It got dark in the middle of the day. And so there are some who make a connection here that this is an inferred prophecy and a roundabout way of saying that there is going to come a time in which the Sabbath day isn't going to be that holy day anymore. And one of the signs that will show you of that change is going to be when there is darkness on a clear day, which would have happened uh, in the measure that we understand it from, from uh, the death of Jesus uh, on the cross and the events that are recorded there. But Amos, as short as the prophecy is, there are a lot of very important and profound things that keep coming out of the book of Amos. There's several different New Testament references to Amos's writing and work. And one of those is found over in Acts chapter 15 in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 15, that's when there was a degree of uh, uh, division or some problem that had arisen in the early church about the idea of binding circumcision upon the Gentile converts. And so they met in Jerusalem to talk about binding the law of Moses on the Gentiles. And so Bar Paul and Barnabas talk about God's blessing their work among the Gentiles. Peter talks about how God had sent him to open the door of salvation to the Gentiles when he went to the household of Cornelius. And then notice what James says in verse 13 of Acts chapter 15. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how that God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. And after this I will return, and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. What prophet was James quoting? Amos. If you go back to Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, you find that that was the passage that uh, James was quoting that talked about the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's plan of things. There's one other interesting point from the, the book of Amos as we wind it up. What happens between the ending of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew in terms of revelation given from God? Do we have inspired material that's written after Malachi? No. There's nothing there. There's going to be this long period of silence that is going to happen after God closes the writing to Malachi. Interestingly, over in Amos chapter 8, going down to about verse 11, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. 
after the revelation was completed that God had in store for the Jews and assorted other folks in the Old Testament with the writing of Malachi, God grows silent. And for the next 400 years or so, there's nothing written until the Messiah actually comes. And we start seeing the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies, and we then start seeing the recording of the information that we have that we can hold on to in, in the New Testament. And so it's interesting the way all of it does fall together. And these little nuggets are planted all the way through these minor prophets. V different promises are found through even here in Amos about the future of a Messiah and his coming and the changes that were going to take place. So that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of the high points of what I found in, in the book of Amos. Any other questions or comments as we close out tonight? David? That's right. God had given his warnings. God had given his challenges. They had not listened. So God said, I'm, I'm done for a while. And just left that silence to seep in. And it made quite, a, quite an impact. Okay. Yes, anything else? Okay, what you have happened in looking at history in that gap between the Old Testament and the New. We find that you have that period of time when the Romans are firmly in power by the time you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There were numerous Jewish rebellions as they tried to you know, claim that so-and-so was a Messiah and do something to run out the Romans. And the Maccabees, it, there is a, a period of time in which there is an invasion uh, where the, there were not so much an invasion but a rebellion by the, the people of the region to drive out the foreign invaders. They were trying to get rid of first the Greeks and they also wanted to get rid of the Romans if they could. You know, and so that period of the Maccabees and the Maccabean revolt is right there in that 400 year period. And uh, the history of some of the historical events that happened there are in the book of first and second Maccabees, which is in the collection of books sometimes referred to as a, the Apocrypha books that had popular reading in, in that era of that 400 years, but there's not compelling evidence for them to be included as divine text because there's some problems in no references from God. There's no other things that do not show the evidence of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Canticles? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Those are that's a set of books that that give historical reference, but they are not books that were deemed to be inspired. You know, there's no claim in them to being inspired. Uh, there is no quoting from those books by anyone in the New Testament uh, that this, as was spoken in any of those books, they just did not pass the muster, so to speak, of having the credentials of being completely certified as inspired material. And as a result of that, some of the older Bibles, I've got one at the house the same way, and some groups today, those are the Bibles that they also, they want those apocryphal books in there. But like, there's one of them that's entitled Bell and the Dragon, and there's several of them that kind of make you scratch your head a little bit in, in thinking about how God would, would want to fashion that into something for mankind as, in, as term, in terms of essential material. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's, that's true. Because of those inconsistencies, uh, they didn't match up with what we knew was authored by inspired writers. As a result of that, it just threw more and more and more doubt upon the, the authenticity of those books as being divinely inspired because God's never talked out of both sides of his mouth. You know, we've had uh, a more consistent revelation than that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, well, appreciate all your, your comments and input. Thank you so, so very, very much. As we think about the events of the day and the things that go on, we just never cease to be amazed at the type of behavior that we see evidenced by those who know not God. Now, there are forces within our culture, especially looking at, at the mass media, that really want to try to find a way to pin every horrible, tragic thing that happens somewhere over onto individuals who tend to be more of a religious persuasion. And some of the first things that were said, and there, there was a recent shooting at what was a gay bar in Colorado. Several people were killed. And immediately the, the media wanted to jump on, you know, what they could find about this guy and, and that there were individuals who, who were just speaking hate and, and they got this guy fired up and look what that does and, and look what happens. And then they finally find out the rest of the facts and find out that this guy himself was one that declared himself, we've been talking about some of the difficulties that folks go through when they declare themselves to be transgender. Well, this guy was not from some hate group over here in the corner that was heavily religious, but rather instead he was Transgender, or declared, at least declared himself to be non-binary, more on their end of the spectrum, shall we say. But still, horrible things happened and people died. You know, sometimes folks are just really quick to want to point a finger, and they will make the stories and make the headlines as though it's anybody who is the least bit religiously inclined or anybody who has the courage to say that there is a right and that there is a wrong in our society. And if you're very vocal at that, then immediately you become the bad guy. And so the line basically is bolder than ever that we've got on one hand those individuals who look at God's word and are willing to accept it in its wisdom. They are willing to look at what God has said, and they strive to be obedient to it. On the other hand, you have the voices of man. And so man says, no, this is the way it needs to be. You know, the Bible talks about marriage, as Jesus talked about it in Matthew 19, that a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. He made them male and female. That helps have, it has roots back here in God's word as to what makes a marriage, biblically speaking. But man's word is different from that. It can be any combination you want it to be. Man with man, woman with woman, whatever. That's their right. They have, and yes, they have those choices. But who are you listening to? Which set of voices are you going to listen to? And that's what becomes a consistent problem. If we're speaking as the oracles of God, as Peter tells us to, as we strive to speak as the oracles of God, it's going to fly in the face of man's wisdom. And whenever that happens, they often tend to want to take the, the Christian to that, those individuals who will be looking to the word of God and try their best to discredit it, to make it wrong. Same thing is happening. I've been reading several articles this week about individuals who want to go back and rewrite some of American history. You know, we know the story 
of how whenever the pilgrims landed on, in this country that indeed they had a very hard time. And it was, if it had not been for the help of some of the Native Americans in the area, they would have probably all starved to death and died. But through their help, they finally began to get on their feet and Thanksgiving was a celebration of the fact that they were able to make it through a hard winter, they had learned some hard lessons and things began to get better for the colonists as they learned more about how to to do things in this country. Well, now, I guess it was three or four different articles I read this week of individuals just ranting and raving about why should we have a day of Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is a terrible thing because just look at what happened. Those colonists came over to this country and as a result of that, the Native Americans got pushed off their land and we have the genocide of Native Americans and look at all those things that eventually happened from that. I don't want anything to do with something called Thanksgiving because that's just one group of individuals thinking they're superior to somebody else. That's not at all what it was. It was a celebration of thanksgiving that two diverse groups could get along. It was a thankfulness that they had managed through a very difficult time. And coming from the pilgrims' point of view, there was a thankfulness to God that they'd been spared because over half of them had died. It was a time to rejoice and to be thankful. But folks can come along a couple hundred years later and let's rewrite that history. Let's go back and kind of pick it apart. And yes, our American history is filled with some terrible things and bad choices that even were policy for a while. But then over time, fortunately, in many situations, we learn better and we've been able to improve the lot a good deal. We're not done yet seeing things that can be fixed, but we've made a lot of progress. But instead, some folks want to go back, oh, we can't have anything to do with the Declaration of Independence because the guy that wrote it was a slave owner. So that means all the, all the instructions in there should just be thrown away and discarded. No. Yeah, that institution was bad and I'm glad we got rid of it. But at the same time, the man's wisdom that he wrote on paper for that particular purpose is pretty good. And on and on the stories go as we think about exalting righteousness in whatever forum we can find to talk about the blessings of listening to God's word, doing things God's way, and treating one another as we should. That's what it's all about. You know, sometimes we kind of forget that. We don't want to remember all the blessings that God's given and all of those instructions about love your neighbor as yourself, we have some grudge or some burr under our saddle and we just can't seem to forgive. And yet, all you have to do is scan the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus talks about forgiveness. In Matthew 6, verse 14, if you forgive men their, trespass, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's some things we've got to forgive and let go and help and hope and pray for God to give us the strength to manage with that. And then we find over in chapter 7, the golden rule, as it's sometimes referred to in verse 12, therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you. How do you want to be treated? That's the way you should treat others. Do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophet. We can go to God's word and see how we are to treat one another. We can go to God's word and see what's good and what's bad. We can go to God's word and see times when man's made mistakes and he's now turned from that or should be encouraged to turn from that. But man's word takes you in a circle. So many times there's been some things that were so bad we can't do, but now we'll accept it and say that it's all all right. Back and forth, the instability of man's wisdom is evidenced. But the truth of God is sure and steadfast. It's not going to swing away from us. And we're going to be able to stick with the truth of God 
do the things that he has commanded and we can be obedient to his will and we can go to heaven when this life is over and so tonight it may be that we have some in our audience that need to do something to make their lives right in the sight of God we don't know the hearts of each individual and if there's something tonight you need to take care of to make your life right in the sight of God and if there's some way we can help you won't you come as together we stand and sing number 600 number 600 Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today.